So I'm excited that all of you have come here today after Thanksgiving. Um, I thought maybe everyone would stay home uh, after all the turkey or whatever celebrations. And so I figure I just want to give you a message today before we enter into the Advent season about relationships. So I want to talk about five keys to life-giving relationships. And before we do that, it is time to dismiss the kids. Kids, go on out. I'm surprised Karen wasn't like flagging me down, like, go, go. Or some kid run up on the stage. All right. But I want to talk to you about five keys of life-giving relationships. If you want to follow along, we're in the YouVersion app under events. There's also paper notes at the Welcome Center that if you want to write some things down, we have those. Um, we reintroduced those after COVID. We realized some people want paper notes, so we reintroduced that. But today is about five keys of relationships. Since we're between Christmas and Thanksgiving... All of you are in relational intensive things right now. Maybe you're coming off a great week of Thanksgiving. You had life-giving relationships. It was great. Or maybe it was a tough time and you're here today saying, I need a little bit more of Jesus because this was a tough thing. And whatever you're at, whatever challenges you're facing, I hope this, this, this can encourage you today. I personally remember Thanksgiving and Christmas growing up. For a long time, I'd go to either my, my dad's or mom's parents' house, so grandma or grandpa's house. Then it ended up at my aunt's house. And then it ended up over at my parents' house. And now my dad has passed away. Family has scattered. So Thanksgiving is a little bit different in Christmas. I also remember sitting at the kids' table. Anyone have to sit at the kids' table? All right, it's like you have the adult table and then you have the medium table and then the kids' cart table. Like the kids were the leftovers. And so I remember sitting at the kids' table on many Christmases and Thanksgivings. Um, but I realize now that's almost 30 years ago that I was sitting at the kids' table. How fast life goes. And for all of us, we are in relationship to one another. Currently, and with this, all of us can admit relationships are complicated. Things are ebbs and flows, and it's a challenge to keep life-giving relationships through all seasons of life. Currently, I am in a doctoral program. I'm in year two of it. And just two weeks ago, I went with a group from Fuller Seminary for a one-week intensive Leading up to that intensive, I read extensively, did different projects, and then gathered with 10 people from all over the world in San Antonio, Texas. Here's my group that I met with. We stayed at a retreat center in Texas. We shared meals together, worshiped together, prayed together, studied together, and formed these life-giving relationships. It was an amazing time. And what I realized is some of those people I just met for the first time. Others I'd been traveling with for about a year. And if you're wondering what the background is on that picture, that is the Alamo. Um, so remember the Alamo. I'm not quite sure what that means, but that's what they tell me. But with this, it was amazing to think that in such a short period of time, I had these depths of life-giving relationships, which, which makes me wonder, what is it that makes relationships life-giving? Why is it that we can be in relationships with people for year after year after year, and when we see them, it's anything but life-giving? But then we meet other people, and instantly we connect and have these deeper relationships with them. Sometimes it's because over time, relationships get complicated. And we have to work on them and there's struggles and, and sometimes new relationships are nice and fresh, but then as they get complicated, they aren't as life-giving. So let me give you five keys to help you navigating these relational waters as you go through the holidays and other situations in your life. And the first key is commitment. Commitment. To have a life-giving relationship, you need to have commitment. Acts 2.42, all the believers devoted themselves the apostles' teachings, and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, this is right after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God was poured out on the early church. 
From there, Peter preached to a massive crowd and 3,000 people came to faith in Christ on that first day. Imagine that, going from about 120 believers to 3,000 and then figuring out how to live in relationship with all these people. It would get complicated very quickly. And the key is in one of those first verses there, first words there. It says, they devoted themselves. They committed themselves to certain things that led back to life-giving relationships. They committed themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, sharing meals, and prayers. You can see how much of this is about being devoted relationally to one another. When you share meals together, when you pray together, when you have fellowship with one another, there's a sense of deepening of relationships. We are just finishing up our neighborhood groups for the semester. They all wrapped up about three weeks ago. And in these groups, a group of about, say, six to 15 people meet for eight weeks. Many of them share meals together, pray together, open God's word together, support one another. And I can tell you this last semester, I led two groups. And in those groups, the relationships deepened. I got to know people on a more personal level. I got to see more of what was happening in their lives. And I walked away and I said, wow, these relationships have become more life-giving because I committed to it. I committed that time, that space to develop those relationships. Life-giving relationships take commitment. Second, life-giving relationships take communication. These are basics, but you cannot have a relationship if you're not communicating. We can often think we're communicating, but sometimes we're not. And with the advent of technology, it's easy to be in the same room and same space and not communicating. All of us are familiar with this picture, and all of us have been guilty of this picture in some way, that we're in a room and the phone is out and we're trying to live in a relationship with somebody, but really we aren't even present there. We are somewhere else. Pew Research in a 2019 survey stated that about half of dating couples stated their partner was distracted by their cell phone in conversation. Half of dating couples. I've also heard of surveys being done that if you're at a table with somebody and you put your phone on the table, it actually sh makes the conversation shallower. Just by having your phone on the table, even if you're not touching it or responding to messages there. But maybe you're not into mobile devices. Maybe you have that under control. But just because you're in the same space does not mean you are communicating. You can be distracted by a computer, a TV, a newspaper, or something else. Quality time is not simply being together. It's eliminating distractions so we can actually be communicating. Communication takes time. It takes space. And I know that relationships change over time. There are people that I lived with for years, and now I barely talk to. If I look at my family, I grew up in a certain home with my mom and dad and brothers and sisters, and now that we've moved to different parts of the country, those levels of communication have changed because you aren't under the same roof. Have you ever been in a relationship where you are making the majority of effort and the others are barely making an effort? You make the phone calls, you send the text messages, you're making the effort, that there's not a two-way reciprocal relationship. It really does take two to make a thing go right. It takes two to make, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just took it back to the 90s for all of you. Um, unless, we, unless we take the time, unless we take the time to communicate, we will naturally drift, drift away. And communication isn't only about what we're saying with our words, it's what we're showing with our actions. Jesus says this in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. 
He didn't say, just say, I love you. He said, demonstrate it with how you live your life. And the same in our relationships. If we say we are communicating, we are loving people around us, we need to show it with our actions. James 2.18 says the same thing with faith and works. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. There's this relationship to saying what we believe and how we live our lives. And so if we're working on communicating, we don't need to just say, hey, I'm a good good communicator. Our lives need to demonstrate this. We need to lean into it. Life-giving relationships take commitment. They take communication. And third, they take consideration. Consideration, Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. What would our world look like if we took this verse seriously and applied it to our lives? What would our politics look like if both parties took this verse and applied it to the way that they interact with one another? What would our world look like if we took this verse and applied it to people that we disagree with and say, I'm going to actually look out for the others. I'm going to be considerate of one another's understanding to another. I'm going on 19 years of marriage to my wife, Nami. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. It's, but with this, over time, you hope that your relationship gets better. And I've heard it said that over time, sometimes you can just become roommates. Sometimes you can live under the same roof, but you're really not on the same page. You're really not communicating. You're really not considering the needs of the other. It can become all about you. I remember earlier in our marriage that when we would get ready for vacation, I would get stressed out of the things we had to pack and what we need to do. And usually it would come to a head right when we were loading up the car and getting ready to leave. Who wants to go on vacation with somebody who's frustrated and angry? What a great start to a week away, right? But that was my normal pattern, that I would get frustrated and angry because of all this stress of like getting ready and getting set for vacation. And over time, my wife lovingly at times um, pointed that out to me. That wasn't a great way to start vacation and just calm down, Mark, and let's learn how to communicate differently. And so over time, I've watched that I've changed, not because I necessarily wanted to change, but I realized that my behavior, my actions were not being considerate of my wife, and it was setting the whole vacation in a different way. I could have said, well, that's just the way I am. Well, and that's, that's just the way I am. You're gonna have to deal with it, honey. But that's not being considerate of her. That's saying, I, you should adjust to me versus I should adjust to you. If we are willing, wanting to be considerate of others, this means we look at ourselves and say, how can I adjust to create more life-giving relationships with another? Maybe you're familiar with the five love languages written by Gary Chapman, which states that each one of you has a love language. And there's five dominant ones, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, and gift giving. These are ways that we receive love and also give love to others. And there's some nuance in here. Some have more than one or multiple ways, but every person has some mix of this, the way that we give and receive love. And when we understand a person's love language, it will help us both give and receive love and be more considerate of another. My wife's love language is quality time. She wants to take time together and I could just say, well, that's not my love language because it isn't. Mine is physical touch. And mine is words of affirmation. 
But to be considerate of my wife, I need to say, how can I carve out time to have quality time with my wife? I can't demand that she gives me in the languages that I receive and give, but I can be considerate of the one around me. And this is not just for marriage. Do, and for marriage, this is a very common thing. Do you know your partner's love language just by looking at that? Do you know the way that you should be giving and receiving love to them? If not, lean over, ask them, and they can probably tell you, and you can start even today. How about for your kids? Do you know your kids' love language? Do you know friends around you and coworkers? And this isn't about romantic. It's saying, how do I feel affirmed, and how do I bring life into relationships around me? Often you can find out what somebody's love language is by what they do. If, they're, if it's gift giving, you constantly get gifts to them and they are thoughtful gifts, all right? That is a gift giving. If they're affirming people and giving words of affirmation, that's more than likely their language. If they're, if they're a hugger, it's probably that that's part of their love language. But we learn to be considerate of one another's in all our different areas of life. We live in such a polarized time in history to, that to be considerate is so out of the norm. I've watched people because of simple, small things and not leaning in to understand the other, just check out of relationships. I've watched people leave churches over minimal things or the pastor gets up and says something that they don't disagree, they disagree with and they leave and they never even have a conversation and say, tell me more about this pastor. During COVID, people left the church because of ways that the church handled or mishandled the church and mishandled COVID in their minds. And many of them never had a conversation with anybody. There was no seeking to understand taking into consideration and saying, how can we live in a life-giving relationship with one another? So I ask you, are you considerate to those around you? Are you considerate of their needs, of their love language? Are you leaning into that? Life-giving relationships takes consideration. Fourth, love, life-giving relationships takes conflict resolution. Ooh, we love this one. It takes conflict resolution. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 12, 18. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Another translation says, as far as your half, live at peace with all people. You can be committed, you can be communicating, you can be considerate, but if you are not resolving conflicts with those around you, fractures are forming. I was just in the Smoky Mountains this last week with my family on a little family vacation. And one of the things that came up was that in mountains, what happens is if there's a crack in a mountain, over time, water will seep into that crack. And with freezing and thawing, it'll begin to expand and contract and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And at times, it will even create caves or massive holes. And it's the same with conflict. A little crack over time will expand throughout life and not just remain a little crack, it will create chasms in relationships. Conflict is not bad, but we need to look at how we can handle and resolve conflicts in our life. I do things for premarital counseling and for marriage counseling called Prepare and Rich. And they talk about four elements in a relationship and two of them, if you don't do them well, it is a sign that your relationship might not last over time. And the two things are communication and conflict resolution. If you're not communicating and if you're not resolving conflict, your relationship will not continue to move towards health and wholeness. It will begin to collapse and fall apart over a time. We need to be able to lean into relationships and resolve conflict. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can fight and you can fight fair. And there's things in relationships that if we do them, they become destructive. For example, when I was early married in our premarital counseling session, my, our, our, our a couple we were meeting with said to each other, don't make fun of each other and don't put each other down in public or in private. 
And we're like, yeah, 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 whatever, not a big deal. We can be sarcastic. We can joke with one another, blah, blah, blah. And from our cultural come-froms, I remember one day we went out to some kind of gathering, and we were being kind of sarcastic and poking fun at each other at that gathering. And afterwards, my wife Nami and I got in the car, and we looked at each other and said, nope, we don't want to create that pattern in our relationship. We don't want to be people who put each other down. We don't want to do that in public. We don't want to do that in private. And so we've made a decision early on to not name call one another, to not belittle one another. And it's easy in relationships to throw stones or say things in the heat of a moment. You are this, you are that. And it destroys the relationship. It creates conflicts. And we aren't fighting fair. We aren't addressing the problem. We are fracturing the relationships. I can tell you for Nami and I, we want to be people who affirm and build up and support one another, not destroy and tear one another down. When it comes to our earthly relationships, we have to learn how to talk through difficulties and resolve conflict. In Matthew 18, we read that when somebody sins against you, we are supposed to go ahead and address it, work through it, and even invite other people in to restore relationship. Matthew 5, 23 to 24 says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. The apostle John puts it this way, how can you say you love God when you hate your brother and sister? How can you say you're in a healthy relationship with God when you are living in fractured relationships here? Go make it right with those around you and then come and have a whole relationship with God. There's a direct correlation towards how we live in relationship with one another and how we are living in relationship or not living in relationship with God. We must be willing to lean into relationships, work through conflicts as far as on our half. Now, friends, I'm going to make it a little even more personal. If you've been part of a church for a while, you realize that churches are messy and have conflicts too, right? Probably can get an amen to that. If you've been married for a while, you realize there's conflicts. If you've been in church for a while, you realize there's conflicts. People have different opinions, different perspectives, and then you try to bring them together and things happen. And you get to look at it, many of you, from a congregational view. I get to look at it from a leadership staff view. It's just two different views of the, the same thing. I remember one time being at a church where one of my leaders told me that I could not go back to school with my time and my money. And I said to them, oh, wait, hold on a second. So you're telling me in my spare time outside of church context, I can't do what I'm wanting to do. And so what I told them is, well, here's the healthy boundary that's not for something for you to say to me. You can't tell me I can't do this in my own life, in my own space. I'm not doing something sinful. I'm doing something I believe God is calling me to. That person who was in a leadership position over me was not happy. I made a decision to continue to lean into relationship as far as on my half, live at peace with that person, but set a healthy boundary. In another case, uh, I was at a different church and there was a pretty mass exodus of people from the church over some legitimate things that they felt. And the next Sunday I got up and I said to the church, as far as on my half, I will live at peace with all people. I am not going to walk around the city and walk into Home Depot and see somebody I oh, left the church and go in a different direction. I'm gonna make a decision to walk right up and say, how are you doing? You're still a brother and sister in Christ. If you've decided to go somewhere else and worship in some other community, that's okay. I am going to make a decision to live at peace with all people. And I got up and I said that to the congregation. I made a choice to do that. And I can tell you, I have walked through many different things in a small town where I saw people who had left the church and I went up and I said hi to them. I greeted them. I loved them and made a decision as far as on my half, I'm going to live at peace with all people. Conflict resolution is important to healthy relationship. And the same that we were called to live at peace with other people, we're called to live at peace with God. And now I'm going to meddle even a little bit deeper. 
How many of you have had conflicts with God? We don't like to admit that. Huh? We got one, amen. Thank you for being honest. Yeah, but in reality, we don't see the big picture. And we face things in our lives and we struggle with things in our lives and we wrestle with things in our lives and we go, God, I don't understand. You are annoying me. I'm angry with God. I don't understand these things. And all of a sudden we come to this place of conflict. And if we're honest, either we can bury that and leave it unresolved or lean into relationship with a God and say, God, I don't understand, but I know you're good. I, I don't understand the big picture, but God, I'm gonna trust you in this. God, I know you love me, but this does not feel like love. And if we're real, willing to lean into relationships with others and with God and lean into even conflicts in a healthy way, it will create more life-giving relationships in our lives. For you scientists out there in the area of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics states this, that the state of entropy or disorder of the entire universe as an isolated system will always increase over time. Basically, it's saying that heat is gonna move towards cold and heat is more orderly and cold is more disorder. So in general, if you leave a system to itself, it will not get better, it will fall apart. It's a law of nature, it's a universal law. And if the universe moves towards disorder, if we don't tend to it, what do you think about the relationships in your life? Will they become more orderly if you just leave them as they are? No. They will begin to fall apart. They'll begin to crumble. And at some point you might wake up and say, I don't even know this person. I don't even know what happened. We need to be able to lean in. Lean in and resolve conflict. We need to have those hard conversations. Deal with the conflicts. And you can't change how people act towards you, but you can make a decision on your half to live at peace with all people. And finally, a life-giving relationship takes craving. Yes, I'm going for all C's. Mm -hmm. Takes craving. And often we don't use a word like craving when we think about relationships. Usually we just use it with food. I'm craving those sweets, and trust me, I got a sweet tooth. I know sugar cravings. We're craving junk food. I just, I just found out in the last two weeks, and maybe this is old news to you, but they have a label for what we eat in the U.S., and it's called the Standard American Diet or the SAD Diet. I was like, <laughs> why didn't I ever hear about this before? I'm like, yeah, sometimes my diet is pretty sad. The Standard American Diet. But it's easy, it's easy to have unhealthy cravings, but how can we form a craving for life-giving relationships? Is there a longing in you? Is there a desire in you to have life-giving relationships? When you look at your spouse, if you're married, are you like, man, I wanna have a better relationship with you tomorrow than I had today? When you look at your children, do you look at your children and say, man, I want to have a better relationship with my children than what I had in my past. When you look at your coworkers or your friends, do you go like, man, I'm craving for more in this than I currently have. Or maybe you're in a position that you just don't really care. <laughs> like whatever, the relationships are what they are. They is what they is. We're going to just leave it at that. But if you have a hunger and a craving, you will want to move and do what needs to be done to have life-giving relationships. The apostle Paul put it this way about the church in Philippi and, and these believers that he was shepherding and caring for. Philippians 1.8, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. If you think the apostle Paul was all about head and knowledge, you can hear his heart. In this verse, I long for you. I love you. I have this tender compassion for you. I'm leaning into relationship. I'm craving this health and love for you. I love how the psalmist put this about our relationship with God. Psalm 42, one and two, because it's not just about craving relationship with others. It's all about craving relationship with God. 
As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with my God? Do you hear the craving of the psalmist for life-giving relationship with God? As I mentioned before, I was just on vacation in the Smoky Mountains with my family, and we went on these different hikes. And many of the hikes took took us along these beautiful rivers. Here's a picture of one, of just walking through the mountains and these streams, cold, crystal clear water flowing down these streams. And again and again, as I walked along those streams, the verse came to mind, as the deer pants for living water. So my soul longs for you, O God. When can I go and meet with my God? When when can I find the satisfaction in God that nothing else offers? There's a desire, a craving, a longing that God has put in each one of us for him and for life-giving relationships around us. So take a moment Just think about the relationships in your life. If you're married, your spouse, if you have children, children, if you're if you're at some other stage in life, if you're single and have friends or extended family, how would you characterize the relationships in your life? Would you say they are life giving? And if not, why not? Maybe it's one of the areas I just talked about that need a bit of work, commitment, communication, consideration, conflict resolution, craving. And let me just give you some ideas to finish because I believe all of us can make little movements that pay big dividends over time. First, we can recommit to life-giving relationships. If your commitment has fallen off, your commitment to your spouse, your commitment to family, friends, or God has faded, it's never too late to recommit. And you can say even this morning, God, I just recommit to life-giving relationships in my life. Second, you can reopen lines of communication. Maybe the wire's been cut and you can make a decision on your half to reopen lines of communication. You can say to somebody, we haven't talked in a a while, but today I'm gonna make the phone call. I'm gonna make the move. I'm gonna take the time. I'm gonna send the text. I'm gonna be the one to reopen that line of communication. You don't have to just wait for somebody else to do it. You can do it. Third, you can ask God to make you considerate of others. It's easy for us to look at somebody else and say, you need to be more considerate of me right? We love to point out somebody else in it. If that person was more considerate of me, then I could have a life-giving relationship. Maybe right now you're like, somebody else needs to hear this message besides me. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. And we can ask God to make us more considerate. All of us can learn to be more considerate of those around us. Ask God to make you more considerate. Fourth, Make the first move to resolve conflict. Instead of turning your back and saying, I'm going to wait till the other person comes to me, you can decide to turn around and say, I'm going to make the effort to resolve this conflict, to lean into the relationship. Who knows how many families are divided over, you know, not sharing the last piece of pumpkin pie and now they haven't met together for 10 years at Thanksgiving because somebody took the last piece of pie. And some of the things that we have and hold on to are so petty and small that we need to just let go of them and lead into relationship and resolving conflict. But I know for others, there's big things that have happened, hurt that has happened, pain that has been inflicted. And in those spaces, we can still make a choice to forgive and to lean into relationship. This does not mean you put yourself in harm's way. It does not mean that you put yourself in a position where you can be hurt again. You can set healthy boundaries, but you can still lean into relationship and resolving conflict. But you cannot just wait for the other person to make the first move. You make the first move to resolve conflict. And finally, 
increase your appetite for life-giving relationships. If you are not craving a relationship with God, if you're not craving healthy relationships with each other, you need to ask why. What has filled my hunger? Just because you ate a lot of junk food before dinner does not mean you're healthy and full. You feel full, but you have not filled yourself with true life-giving things. If you fill your life with junk relationships, you will have no craving for life-giving relationships. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of social media, But if these things take over your life to the elimination of healthy, life-giving relationships, you need to set some boundaries and lean in to life-giving relationships. As you go into the holidays, I hope you can think about these five things, five areas of life-giving relationships. Commitment, communication, consideration, conflict resolution, and craving. Relationships are fundamental to our lives. And all of us want life-giving relationships. If you've been around Neighborhood Church for a while, you probably know my favorite Christmas movie by now. It's A Wonderful Life. That's my favorite Christmas movie. I watch it every year, and now my kids are actually starting to like it too. I just watched it the other day again. And in that, re- that movie, um, you can watch it in black and white or color, depending on your taste. Um, in that movie... George Bailey tries to leave town again and again and again, get away and explore the world and have these grand adventures. And things keep happening to him that hold him in the small community of Bedford Falls. And what he's held back by is actually caring for people, investing in people, the little guys around town to protect him from the big guys. And later on in life, George is faced with a crisis And he comes to this point that he believes that it would be better if he had never been born. And in those moments, an angel named Clarence appears to him. And Clarence says, I will grant you your wish. You have never been born. And so George goes back into town and discovers that the town is so different. And that all the little things that he thought he'd do made a big difference in a small town. That his life actually made a difference. And at the end of the movie, yes, I'll spoil it for you. It's been out since who knows the 1950s. If you haven't watched by yet, by by now, too bad. I'll spoil it for you. I know. But at the end of the movie, the town rallies to him and provides for his financial needs. And his brother comes and says to George, the richest man in town. And in that same basket full of money, the angel Clarence had dropped a book, Tom Sawyer, And in the front of that book, he had signed it this way. Dear George, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. No man is a failure who has friends. Or we could rephrase that and say, no person is a failure who has life-giving relationships. And my prayer for you in this holiday season is that you'd lean into relationship with God and lean into relationship with others and find a life in both. Father God, I pray for my friends and family here. God, I don't know where they are at with you or in relationship with each other. But God, this, in these moments, if you are speaking to people, may they say a first or fresh yes to you. See that you are wanting whole relationships. And God, may we lean into those relationships. May we make a step ourselves to better become the people that you have called us to be so that we can do the things that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.